Hey guys, and welcome back. And today we're going to discuss bronchodilators. Bronchodilators are basically used to relax kind of that bronchial smooth muscle bands. So when you think of your lungs, your head is here, I'm a terrible drawer, and then your lungs are kind of here. When you have pulmonary disease, everything's narrow and tight and constricted. We're trying to relax kind of expand and relax and kind of dilate to improve airway and therefore improve breathing. So again, the overall goal is to relax and dilate. If you remember those two words, R and D, you're going to be absolutely fine in this section. There are three types of bronchodilators, but first we're going over the first two. Anticholinergics are used to prevent the binding of cholinergic substances with the goal of decreasing constriction and secretions. So we're trying to, again, dilate and decrease the secretions that might block the airway. With exantine derivatives, the goal is to increase the relaxation and smooth muscle. Again, we are relaxing and we are dilating those constricted bronchi and bronchioles. This section is going to be very easy to remember because the word bronchodilators tells you what these drugs do. So make sure you keep that in mind. Our last drug we're going to be covering is beta agonists. Now, these are unique because the non-selective and the selective one hit different kind of receptors. But we are doing the same thing as before. We are dilating the airway. We're trying to expand that narrow airway kind of in the lungs. But each drug class does it differently. We have non-selective here. So we are hitting three. Our first one is our alpha. And then we have beta one which is cardiac, and we have beta-2. So non-selective literally means non-selective overall. You have non-selective beta, so now we're getting rid of the A. So there's no A in this one. We just have beta-1 and beta-2. Then we have super selective. This one only has beta-2. So it's very it's a very tier-step system. The first one is alpha, beta-1, beta-2. Non-selective beta adrenergic is just beta, so beta-1 and 2. And then selective B2 is just beta-2. It's very easy to remember. All right. The types of bronchodilators are broken down into three groups, which we mentioned earlier. Beta agonists, anticholinergics, and exantine derivatives. Most of the acute care or hospital settings are going to do with beta agonists shown here. It's really great because they all kind of have the same ending here. And I'll write it right here. Tara. It's very easy to remember. And the number one in the hospital setting is albuterol and epinephrine. If you have an acute airway issue where your patient's in respiratory distress, those are going to be your go-to. Um, the anticholinergic ones have a very, very easy ending as well. And I'll write that for you. Tropopium, very easy to remember. And the exantine has a very, very, very easy ending as well. The, pharma, the pharmaceutical companies made these really easy for us to remember. But your number one go-to is always going to be the beta agonist, or you're going to dilate those narrowing airways. You're going to decrease, decrease secretions with your anticholinergics. And exantine derivatives are kind of a Three fur, the kind of the, the 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 three musketeers. There is a last one here, and that's what those endings are there. Uh, when you have airway issues, you don't want to just typically give one drug. These three are usually used in combo with again your number one, your number one go to being your beta agonist. So make sure that you keep that in mind. And all these drugs are used in situations of structural or obstructive kind of lung disease or defect. And as you know, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, your blood pressure doesn't matter if you can't breathe. So this is why the beta agonists are very, very important to remember and keep in mind. As we focus on airway, the indications are going to be airway dysfunction based. I mean, you can get all fancy if you want to, but I want you to think of airway dysfunction. And all these drugs are going to cause airway compromise in one way or another. Asthma, acute or chronic bronchitis, emphysema, pulmonary disease, all of these involve some sort of dysfunction. With the bronchitis, you're going to have inflammation. With the emphysema, you're going to have damaged alveoli, pulmonary disease, acute or chronic, and then asthma is going to be narrowing. The point being is that this, this airway is narrowed and it's blocked with secretions, and these drugs are going to help your patient breathe. Again, we are we were attempting to correct narrowing and obstructive bronchi. So these drugs are going to all be airway and pulmonary focused.
Contraindications are going to involve allergies, uh, uncontrolled cardiac dysrhythmias, uh, any patients at a high risk for stroke, or any patients with sore uh, lechen allergies. So I want you to think of why are we talking about dysrhythmias and strokes? Well, oddly enough, these drugs cause vasoconstriction. Remember the non-selective, the alpha? When, when, when you tap into that alpha and that beta one, you're going to have cardiac kind of side effects that take place as well. So if you have a patient that has uncontrolled cardiac dysrhythmias, you're going to be squeezing that heart when you give these medications. If you have a patient that a high risk for stroke, you're, you're, you're squeezing those vessels in that brain. So this is why these two are very important to remember because these drugs cause vasoconstriction. They might compromise the vasculature more than your patient can compensate for. So you must keep that in mind. All right. The interactions here are very interesting. So you remember the vasoconstriction that we talked about before? Remember vaso, vaso, vasoconstriction. Well, the non-selective beta blockers are going to enhance the risk for hypertension because of what? The vasoconstriction. The MAOI inhibitors are going to enhance the risk of hypertension. Why? Because they potentiate that vasoconstriction that already takes place. Uh, when you have digoxin and exantine derivatives, it's going to increase the potential for cardiac toxicity. And then last but not least, we have uh, diabetics. Certain beta agonists are going to cause hyperglycemia. So your patient might be on metformin and that might work for a while and they have asthma and they get these beta agonist treatments. It's going to shoot their blood sugars up. And in some patients, it causes hypoglycemia as well. So with these drugs, you can't just give them and not understand what else your patient has going on. Uh, most patients don't just have asthma. They might have diabetes. They might have coronary artery disease. So as a caregiver, you must know what's going on in a general picture to make sure that this medication is not exacerbating some situations. So again, get that home medication list, find out what can interact with what and go from there. But these are the interactions with bronchodilators. Okay, side effects of anticholinergic are going to be based on us decreasing those secretions. So when you decrease secretions, things tend to get a little dry. You have dry mouth or throat, nasal congestion. Again, we have that vasoconstriction. We're squeezing that heart tight. You might have palpitations. When you're messing with vasculature, you're all, you might even clamp down on that GI tract. So you have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then with that clamping down, you might even have a little bit of anxiety there. So anticholinergics are great because our overall goal is to what? Decrease secretions and kind of help open up the airway, but these are side effects that also occur, so keep that in mind. When exanthine and derivatives, they're kind of all over the place as well, because again, that vasoconstriction is systemic. So again, we have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, sinus tachycardia, again, we have that kind of cardiac vasoconstriction, palpitations, again, cardiac-based, and ventricular dysrhythmias. So if you have a patient on this drug and they have a history of going into V-fib or VTAC, you might exacerbate that. You might potentiate that. That might be something they have an issue with. So again, if you have a patient with severe coronary artery disease or a patient who had dysrhythmias to begin with, this drug class might not be for them. You might have to go back to the anticholinergics and the beta agonists. The point being is that we're trying to help their airway, help their breathing, but not also cause them to go into V-fib or VTAC. Lastly, side effects of beta agonists are related to vasoconstriction as well and deal with cardiac stimulation, restlessness, and insomnia. The cardiac symptoms, when you have heart palpitations, you then, you know, sometimes you get restless and you can't sleep because your heart's beating so fast. So I know the insomnia and the restlessness don't really look related to cardiac, but it is. Again, with beta agonists, you have blood sugar issues. Um, due to that stimulation, you might, your patient might have tremors and even headache. That vasoconstriction not only, you know, is localized to the cardiac system, it spreads. When you have heart palpitations and you're nervous and you're scared and you're shaking, that constriction can cause tremors and headaches. So again, if you have a patient that is given these drugs, you might take tachycardia. Let's say they, they have asthma. So let's say we gave them an albuterol treatment. Oh, their lungs are opening up. They're doing so well. They're happy. But now they, they, they have shaking in their hands. And now they have a headache and now their blood glucose is 200. If you didn't understand the side effects, you would assume all these things are not related, but they are. 
Usually when the medication works its way out of your system, those things kind of taper off and normalize, but you have to make sure you educate your patient on what's going to happen after you give them that treatment and look for these things. Priority nursing concepts for a patient receiving bronchodilators include gas exchange and pharmacology. All right, time for a recap. Now the mechanism of action with bronchodilators is what are we doing? We are and we are Dean. We are relaxing and dilating, and we're also decreasing those secretions with the anticholinergics. There are three types, beta agonists, anticholinergics, and exantine derivatives. Each one doing something different, but the overall goal is to dilate, relax, and decrease secretion. If you keep those three things in mind with those three drugs, you can't go wrong. Indications are based on chronic and acute pulmonary disease or dysfunction. So you might have something that's kind of asthma, respiratory failure, or something chronic like COPD, but these drugs are used for acute and chronic. Now, since we are constricting this heart and we're doing vasoconstriction, we might have some dysrhythmias, we may have some issues with stroke, and then with the inhalations alone, you might have some allergy issues there. So make sure that you keep that in mind. Due to the effects that we're causing, we're drying things out, we're dilating, we're hitting those alpha and those beta one and sometimes two receptors, you're gonna have side effects like dry mouth, cardiac issues, GI distress, and glucose issues. So if you have a patient on these drugs, you, may, you must make sure you educate them on what might follow. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.